We're uh, going to uh, go back to demo mode because it's actually this combination of context, conversation, and, and demonstration uh, that we're excited to be sharing here. And uh, Cleveland is blessed with uh, an abundance of uh, wonderful uh, healthcare uh, uh, organizations. Um, we're going to share a demonstration with one of our other healthcare uh, partners here on uh, home health uh, and wellness is kind of the demonstration we're going to be working with. Uh, we're going to try to make sure that we can find Dr. Lori Sadler, who's going to be joining us remotely. Um, and instead of the house, come on up, uh, Ellen. Come on up, Tony. Um, we're going to uh, hopefully be able to show you here uh, what Ellen uh, will be doing, um, talking to, to her doctor, who's Dr. Sadler. Uh, they actually got together uh, actually in July we did another demonstration, and this is kind of a little bit of a follow-on uh, to that. Um, and rather than, Laura, rather than Ellen being actually in the house, uh, we thought best to bring the patient here just so that you could see, see her um, along the way. But the last time we did this, we actually did it over at the house uh, as she talked to, to her doctor, Dr. Sadler. I want to introduce uh, a couple of our partners who've made this particular demonstration multiple times happen for us. I want to introduce uh, Tony Mato from IBM. Um, and thank our friends from Cisco uh, who are sharing with us uh, really some quite amazing technology. And I don't know I can say this definitively, but what you're about to see, at least right here in the city of Cleveland, is a first. It's actually using telepresence, uh, which uh, you probably can't miss if you've been watching television and seeing kids in China talk to kids in wherever. Uh, we're about to have a demonstration of uh, a real uh, Clevelander. Um, a, a, a friend of, uh, of, of the program that we've been working on who can share her own story. Um, but we're going to let Tony uh, set it up a, a little bit. And uh, thanks again for participating. And we'll hope to get uh, Dr. Sadler uh, online as well. Thank you. This is our second live demonstration. And there we have uh, Dr. Sadler. So this is um, an introduction of a vision for having fiber to the home and having this high quality, um, high definition video. Um, to be able to have this collaboration between um, our brave patient, Ellen, um, who's going to share her story, and uh, Dr. Sadler, who's in her office, um, to have this more frequent and meaningful collaboration about healthcare and not have to go to the office and visit every time. So um, as Lev mentioned, um, Dr. Sadler and Ellen uh, did, had a collaboration about a year ago. We, are, we were actually in the uh, pre-alpha house um, showing this uh, when uh, uh, President Obama's CTO came and visited us. We showed him how we could collaborate using some medical devices and, um, and also uh, patient video to, to have this high quality interaction. So today, um, Ellen is uh, scheduled for a video consult with uh, Dr. Sadler. And the, the promise is in the future that um, uh, Ellen will be able to share her uh, information, her health information, electronically, and then Dr. Sadler and Ellen can collaborate about that um, through this uh, video act interaction. So I'll pass it off to, um, to Ellen and uh, Dr. Sadler. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. How, how have you been since the last time we spoke? Good morning. I'm a lot better, thanks. I know the last time we spoke, I was in between jobs and which is, was a major, major stress. But right now I'm currently employed and that really, really helped my blood sugars a lot. What happened during the, uh, the unemployment situation? Did you, were you having trouble getting your meds or well, you know, the stress to, of the whole situation? I had to switch to COBRA insurance, which was expensive. And being unemployed, it was something that I really couldn't afford, but I couldn't afford not to. Right. Um, so it wasn't an issue. We, it was an issue in terms of being a lot more smart with my money, but um, I made it through. Well, I give you a lot of credit because living with diabetes is not easy uh, for anybody, and especially going through what you went through. Um, can you fill me in on what's happened since the last time uh, medically? Have there been any major changes in your uh, health? During that time? Well, I got to be honest with you. I, I had the worst A1C reading I've ever had in the last 15 years of dealing with diabetes. And what was um, that? A1C was at 10. 10? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what do you think happened during that time? 
I don't what know. What the cost? I don't know. I want to, I want to, I guess, blame it on being unemployed or just the outside circumstances. I have no idea. I was, I'm a patient that prides myself on letting my body give me those signals, and it actually did it. So um, it was an eye-opener in terms of, and I kept saying, check it again, check it again. This is impossible. Um, I can tell you now that the A1C is down to seven, which is phenomenal in itself in the last year. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, uh, when you see a number that's elevated, uh, some of the things we ask ourselves are uh, the meter, is it working properly? Um, has there been a change in any of the medications that could sometimes raise blood sugar? Stress is a huge, huge reason why blood sugars can be elevated. And sometimes just change in activity. You're under a lot of stress and you're not ac exercising the way you'd like to. All those things can contribute. And uh, oftentimes we blame ourselves and we just need to seek answers. Uh, and sometimes there are, there are easy fixes to a lot of the things. But your hard work is really paying off. I'm proud of you. Um, one of the things, I'm looking at your numbers that you sent me over the past two weeks, mm -hmm. and they really look pretty good. Um, the difference between the first week and the second week of numbers is that you're a little bit more elevated in this, the second week. Right. Um, do you have a, a sense of, and another interesting thing I can see on this is that when you're high in the morning, you tend to be high in the evening. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's often a very common thing, which is why we try to bring the fastings down because tends to be patients that get their fastings down tend to stay down the rest of the day. There are some patients who, who break all rules and don't do that, but you seem to be a patient that follows the rules. Um, do you have an explanation for why you may be trending upward in the second week? The second week I had a bronchial infection, which I'm still dealing with, and that was part of it, and the other part, I was just being a bad girl, I guess. Um, I just, I'm, well, you know, I'm from Louisiana, and sometimes that southern cooking can get in the way. <laughs> and, and, but it was really dealing with the um, bronchial infection and, and trying to keep the blood sugars down with the infection in my body. You know, sometimes it's more important to have comfort food and feel better when you don't feel good, and we'll, we'll get things under control with time. Uh, one of the things we learned in the ACCORD trial, I don't know if you're familiar with that, we just finished a big NIH-funded trial, and it, it has been shown that patients with diabetes really require not only blood glucose control, but control of their blood pressure, their blood fats or lipids, and also antiplatelet agents. And it's critically important that we look at all those things because we demonstrated that if we control all those risk factors in patients with diabetes, we cut the event rates for heart attacks and strokes by about 66 percent. So um, what we are going to do for the next many years with, with you and other diabetics is we're going to be very focused not only on the blood sugars, but on uh, all the factors that go into causing risk. And I see you, you showed me your blood pressure at least once was 130 over 80. Was that taken uh, what time of day? Um, that was taken in my last doctor visit a um, couple of weeks ago. It's the highest it's ever been. I, I don't know if I should be concerned or not. I'm usually 120 over 80. I have been for the last 10, 15 years. You that know, kind of scared another, me. I'm sorry? It kind of bothered me a little bit for it to be 130 over 80. Well, I can tell you the, the ACCORD trial did tell us one important message, and that is, at least in the time that we followed patients, going from 130, 35, over 80 to under 120 didn't seem to make a difference in cardiovascular events. So I wouldn't be too concerned about one elevated value, and I wouldn't be too concerned at this point as long as we're addressing all the other risk factors, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, if, however, you had some protein in your urine of significant amount, the blood pressure then does benefit by being lower, okay? But at this point, I wouldn't worry yourself too much about that, but we'll keep a real close eye on it. Okay, great. I really like to see blood pressures monthly if, if I can. Um, what else has been going? Are you taking an aspirin? Yes, I am. I'm taking one a day. Okay, and have you checked your cholesterol recently? Yes, and I'm now taking 10 milligram 
as you prescribed, the simvastatin. And, um, so we need to check that again in the next month to make sure I'm on target. Okay, do you understand what being on target is? Do you know where your levels should be? Have you ever been instructed on that? Well, somewhat, you know. I mean, it's a lot of numbers to take in when you start talking about um, blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pressure. Um, I just know that, you know, with the great team of doctors that I have, that you guys won't let me stray too far. And okay. it was so, as far as the information that I've been given, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm set, I'm on target in terms of what, where those numbers ought to be and, and given the allotted time to get, to get there. I, I just don't want um, any more surprises. I, again, I'm one of these people who prided themselves on my body telling me what is going on. And it was such a surprise, again, with the A1C and the, the blood pressure not to feel different, any different. So, yeah, it sent me running straight back to you. John and uh, Dr. Sadler, um, I'd like to have uh, maybe the opportunity to uh, open it up for a few questions. So um, maybe I'll, uh, if anybody has any questions about, you know, what they see as, uh, as uh, the future of this, go ahead. Hello, my name is John Alexander from Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. <clears throat> my question is, due to the increase in childhood obesity, what is the connection to the risk, the risk of type 2 diabetes, and also how does it impact type 1 diabetes? Well, your question about childhood obesity really pertains more to type 2 diabetes, which is due to often these patients are um, overweight, they have a lot of insulin resistance, and that's the main starting point, whereas type 1 diabetes is more pancreas, uh, doesn't produce any insulin. Um, very early on in type 2 diabetes, the insulin levels are actually elevated significantly, and then eventually over time, many diabetics require insulin uh, for type 2 diabetes, but much later in life as their pancreas begins to um, we call it tire, we get very tired. Uh, the impact of childhood obesity is absolutely huge, and it's largely due to the change in the last 20, 30 years with diet and decreased activity, uh, very, very lifestyle dependent. We see significant numbers of patients earlier and earlier in life with childhood diabetes and earlier onset for type 2 diabetes. We used to see in the 40s and 50s, and now we're seeing them in the 30s and 40s. And the implication of that for cardiovascular events is huge. Uh, more than 70% of patients have heart attacks and strokes who live with diabetes. So this is a major, major, major health problem. Uh, so I have a question, uh, Ellen, and, and both Ellen and Dr. Sadler, about how do you um, envision using a technology like this? How could it change the way you, intera uh, you know, interact, and also, in addition to the video part, sharing, you know, being able to share uh, patient, your patient in information and values electronically. So, Ellen, I guess I'll ask, let you answer first. For the most part, it kind of bridges the gap between I have to make an appointment to go see the doctor, and then they have to take labs and get those results back, and then maybe prescribe something, then it goes to the pharmacy. That's a lot of time, and, and again, because um, being from the South, I'm not used to this weather yet. It, 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 in the winter time, I, I'm more apt to cancel a doctor's appointment because of the snow. Um, with this technology, everything happens real time right away. We have our consult. She sees what she needs to see. That script goes to CVS or to a mail, or, mail order pharmacy. That's what we're kind of going to now. And then the medication is sent. So we're, we've cut down may, essentially two or three weeks down to one day. Right. And that's, that's major. Thank you. Dr. Sadler, what's your observation? Well, for me, this is, uh, this is a, a wonderful vehicle. Um, what we did in some of our research trials was we see patients monthly, and I know that's not reasonable for most situations, but what we demonstrated with that, uh, especially in the diabetic population, we were able to achieve, achieve double the national norms for control of blood pressure, for control of blood glucose, lipid control. We were able to answer questions in between that often come up because the patient's so overwhelmed with all these things. 
Um, we can see uncertainty in a patient's facial expressions. We can, we can cut off uh, risk for hypoglycemia. Uh, our hypoglycemia rates were incredibly low because we had frequent contact and we were able to uh, tease out the cause of the hypoglycemia, which can be significant for some of these patients, and, and really effectively lower it um, about a third of what the national average was again. So uh, the opportunity for very meaningful, uh, I mean, I, I, I believe there's so much more that can be gathered from the nonverbal and the give and take that you can achieve in this type of a setting versus just over the phone. Thank you. And it also, yep. one last thing, it does allow for our whole healthcare team. I work with about five or six certified diabetic educators, and I would want their help and communication directly with Ellen on a regular basis to really um, go over even things like diet, things like lifestyle, and also any questions she might have that come up in between the visits. So it's really for the whole healthcare team, not just for our, us physicians. Right. Well, that was a great point. I think, uh, you know, tying into this uh, broadband capability and the education p part of it to educate students on diet and things like that to, you know, bring that prevention piece in. I, that's an excellent point. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of these uh, pieces of thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Dr. Sandler. Of these pieces of equipment that we have, so we have a, a computer, and you know we're uh, tethered into uh, to a scale, and then we also have a, a blood pressure cuff, and then um, the uh, the medical device organizations are working on. Thank you. Are working on uh, you know the diabetes equipment to support that, so we can electronically send the information in. And if you come over to the Alpha House. We have this set up so that you can see some of the other devices for wellness as well. So it'll be uh, pretty interesting to have some detailed discussions. So thank you again. Thank you, Tony.